Turning to our panel theme, there are many substantial questions on this topic. We're delighted to welcome some of our country's leading thinkers to the conversation this afternoon. Many of you will know Roger Gibbons, who's the former leader of the Canada West Foundation and now a senior fellow with the Max Bell Foundation in Calgary. Roger kicked off a great conversation for us in Calgary back in 2013, and he's agreed to return to a topic he's been studying for Max Bell this whole past year. Alex Himmelfarb is also well known to many of us. A former clerk of the Privy Council in Ottawa, no one is better placed than Alex to speak about policy and politics. Currently, Alex is playing a very active role in the nonprofit sector as a member of the board of the Atkinson Foundation and chair of both the World Wildlife Federation and the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. Moderating the discussion between Alex and Roger will be Graham Fox, president of the Institute for Research on Public Policy. This promises to be an excellent tour of the key issues and questions that will come up again and again tomorrow during the symposium itself. And I now invite Graham to kick us off. Thank you very much. Um, merci beaucoup. Bon après-midi tout le monde. Uh, my name is Graham Fox. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to moderate this panel this afternoon uh, with Alex and Roger. Uh, I promise that if things get out of hand, I will mm -hmm. switch seats uh, <laughs> to keep things uh, civil. Um, but I, I have I've selected this one so that I can see as much of the room as possible uh, for the uh, the period in this panel where we, we will be uh, inviting comments and questions from the audience. Um, to get us started, uh, we, we've asked uh, Alex and Roger to prepare some informal remarks, um, but the, the focus of this session, I hope, uh, will be in the exchange uh, with the room. I think, uh, uh, as was alluded to earlier, um, the change uh, coming to Ottawa and what that might mean uh, for this sector and others uh, probably brings a little bit more urgency or a little bit more relevance to this conversation uh, than might perhaps uh, otherwise have been. Uh, and so uh, we hope uh, that there will be many of you uh, lining up at the two microphones that you will find in the room uh, at the time um, putting your questions and your comments to the panel. <coughs> Et avec un bon nom français comme Graham William Fox, uh, s'il y a des gens qui sont plus à l'aise à, à faire leur intervention uh, dans la langue de Molière, sentez-vous bien à l'aise de le faire? We will provide some simultaneous interpretation uh, right from the stage. Uh, and so, uh, without further ado, uh, Roger's agreed to, uh, to say a few words uh, on some of the research and some of the thinking uh, that you've been doing over the last, uh, over the last few years. Uh, and so, à vous la parole. Good. Well, thanks, Graham. <coughs> I'll try to uh, speak quickly. Um, for the past year, I've been working on a project with the Max Bell Foundation on policy advocacy by charity, charitable organizations trying to build the case for a larger role by charities in policy advocacy. So I'm trying to build a case that there's a moral imperative for charities to be involved in the, in the political process, focusing on what charities should be doing, not what they're not doing or what they can or cannot do. And on the way, I've been making some recommendations for modernizing the relationship between the Government of Canada and the charitable community. Also, what began as a sidebar, but which is sort of moving more in the center of my thinking, is to look at the competitive environment in which charities operate as thought leaders. I argue that the advocacy constraints on charities means that they are increasingly outgunned in competition with other groups in, in terms of thought leadership. And to use an analogy that I apologize for, given that this is such a gentle, a gentle crowd, but charities risk bringing butter knives to a gunfight. And they're not doing well. So when Hillary uh, asked, does philanthropy have a role to play in the public landscape, my answer is emphatically yes. It's a role that, in fact, needs to be expanded. But it's a role that is not guaranteed going forward into a very different competitive environment. So the bulk of my comments are going to relate to the Liberal Party's campaign platform and what it had to say uh, about the, uh, the charitable sector. So I'll look through the very sort of cloudy lens of that, of that uh, campaign platform. Two parts to it. The first part pledged to end the political mm -hmm. harassment of charities. This was clearly a welcome news for the, for the sector. However, it creates a very serious challenge for the Government of Canada in the next couple of years. 
the charge of political harassment was an accusation prior to the election and one that the uh, CRA vigorously denied. However, the campaign has transformed an accusation into a fact. It accepts as fact that regulators were harassing charities. The campaign pledge, therefore, to end harassment undermines the integrity and professionalism <laughs> of the regulators. As a consequence, political activity aud audits will be all but impossible in the next couple of years. A targeted uh, charity, and I use the word targeted very, very lo loosely, will shout harassment <laughs> whenever the audit is, is, is announced. The PMO will then step in immediately to quash the audit to ensure that the Prime Minister's pledge not to harass charities will be, will be upheld. So I think we're moving into kind of a regulatory wild west in terms of the political activities of charities. Eventually, governments are going to have to find some way of reimposing um, control, reimposing some integrity on the regulatory framework. Because by and large, tax officials do not like regulatory anarchy. But for a couple of years, I think, we're going to have even more confusion and uncertainty given the, the first liberal pledge. The second pledge is is really central, I think, to the discussion today and tomorrow. The Liberal campaign platform included the commitment to clarify the existing rules to clearly affirm and support the important role that charities can and should play in developing and advocating for public policy in Canada. So talking about charities developing and advocating for public policy in Canada. This is a hugely important commitment in terms of the charitable sector. And it's potentially very good news because it opens the door, at least potentially, to some legislative, some parliamentary recognition of the role that charities have or could have within the policy process. And there's a good fit between the charitable sector and the government of the day, a good sort of ideological convergence, a shared belief in constructive, big, expansive government. And there will be, I suspect, a fair, about a fair bit of personal mobility as the government recruits out of the charitable sector in order to staff its own, its own activities. So the question I want to address, and I'll do so quickly, is how do we get the new Liberal government to act on this commitment? So a couple of things here. First of all, it will not be on the government's agenda for the first couple of years. Not at all. The government's agenda is very crowded, regardless of what happens in terms of new, new events. It's an extraordinarily busy agenda. The charity sec sector will not be on that agenda, at least until, I would argue, the third year of the mandate. We won't be able to elbow our way onto that agenda, no matter what we try. But this is probably a good thing because we're really not ready for the debate that's, that's to come. As a sector, we need to dust off earlier proposals, broadband proposals. We have to get our ducks aligned if you want. It's not our first rodeo. We've done a lot of work on this, but we have to pull that together. And we need to build support across the sector. We have to build a parade. We have to construct the floats you know, hire the marching bands, hire the clowns, uh, recruit the parade marshal, blow up the balloons, all of those things before any politician would think of stepping in and leading that parade. You would have to be a very crazy government, insane government, to try to lead this file yourself. It's too complex, too difficult, too risky. Only a fool would sit down with 86,000 86, charities and say, now let's talk, right? Not going to happen. So if the government is going to act on its commitment, the charities themselves will have to do the heavy lifting. The government will not lead this. Also keep in mind that if the government fails on this commitment, there's no political cost. 
The charitable section is so firmly entrenched now in the liberal tent. It doesn't matter. We're not going to wander off anywhere else. Okay, we're there, come hell or high water. And so it's a commitment that the government can play fast and loose with if it chooses to do. So this brings me to my final comment on Stephen Harper. Over the past few years and during the campaign, Canadians have tended to personalize virtually every political problem. Harper was the root of all evil. By contrast, Trudeau would return us all to the liberal Camelot. So Harper, bad, Trudeau, good. It's sort of complex policy language, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that this belief may damage the momentum we have to, re to rebuild, to modernize the relationship between charities and the Canadian state. It may dampen any attempt to strengthen the advocacy role of charities. If Harper is the problem, Trudeau is the solution, enough said. Let's go have coffee. However, I'm convinced that if we miss this opportunity, if we coast, we will be toast in the new competitive environment. So we, you, uh, have our work cut out. If we want to shore up the advocacy role of charities, if we want to amplify policy advocacy, if we want to compete effectively for thought leadership, then we have to come up with a new model of advocacy, a new relationship between the, third, the charities and the federal government. If we decide to sit out the policy game, or if we're regulated out of that game, others will be more than ready to take our place. And here I just introduce you to what I call Bob from Nanaimo, sitting on his couch, one o'clock in the morning, tablet on his lap, glass of scotch in his hand, ready and willing to blog to the policy world until dawn breaks out. That's our competitor going forward. He's not going to be regulated. We have to figure out what our role is going to be. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Roger. I suspect we'll be saying more about parades and Bob from Nanaimo <laughs> later on. Um, but uh, before we get there, uh, Alex, from your uh, perspective as someone who's done work uh, with charitable foundations uh, and obviously having led uh, the Public Service of Canada, what are your opening thoughts? Well, when, when Hillary first approached me, and I'm delighted to, to be with Roger and, and Graham, I, I, I was going to do a, uh, just a, a, a barnstorming, fire-eating, inspiring talk about the big chill, the chill on dissent, the, uh, the harassment, which wasn't such a terrible word in my view, without any uh, implication of agency misbehavior, and the extent to which more and more of, of discussion of those who wanted to get into the public policy game was about how best do we survive the chill, how best do we fight back against it, and then October 19 happened, and I just have nothing to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, I mean, it, it is. It, it seems to me, you know, it, there's something very important happened on October 19, and I say this in a truly nonpartisan way. Uh, you could argue that the best way to deal with with the chill is sunny days, and uh, we have now a huge opportunity to turn the corner. The challenge, however, I think, is we don't know what corner we want to choose. <laughs> we have a, a chance to make a huge difference, but we don't know what we want to ask for. And we don't, I think, have a clear and shared notion of what the barriers are to making a big difference in the policy game. So what is it? Why do we want to be in the policy game? What is our unique value added to be in that game? And what are the barriers? Because I mean, to, my great, to my great dismay, there's much in what Roger said that I agree with. Um, if I find it really disconcerting. But the, and, and surely we'll find significant areas to, to, to quarrel. But I think it's a very dangerous thing 
to see the problems having started in 2006 or being accelerated in 2012 and that budget, and then solved in 2015 with an election. The problem started, I would argue, decades ago. The challenge and the threats to the voluntary sector started decades ago. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. And I want to talk about it in a, in a way free of data and research, in a, but based, based largely on, on my own experience from inside the public service on how we changed our views of you. Of not just funders, but of the voluntary sector as a key part of civil society. Let me preface it by making it just a, a case of what I think that ties together this, this diverse sector, the charitable and voluntary sector, that is your distinct va value. And I think the, 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 the key to what makes you a particular voice that nobody else brings is your independence. Your independence of government and the state, your independence of commercial interests and the market, your independence, your ability to speak without fear or favor, your ability to represent those people you seek to serve, your members, and often the most vulnerable and marginalized among us, your ability to develop innovative ways of serving those people, independence of voice, independence of action. That's your value added. And there, there, there's going to be all kinds of people telling you you have to be more like think tanks. You have to professionalize your advocacy. And, and probably there's merit to that. What's most important in my view is to recover your independence, to be fearless, and to provide your advice with a, a clear commitment to the public good and a clear ability to speak for, you, for those you serve, for your members, and for the most vulnerable. Okay, so that's, that's, and my view is that that independence can't be taken for granted. In fact, it's been eroding for a couple of decades, not just the last few years. And I can say, when I came into public service, because I I've, I've was a public service for almost 120 years, so I've <laughs> seen, I've seen a, a, a huge transformation, and I came in at the end of the period of building the welfare state. It's actually what attract, attracted me to the public service to be part of the building, but I was at the tail end. I just came in just a, as the door was closing and moving into a new era where cutting taxes, reducing government's footprint, reducing government's influence on the market became the driver. And I, so I saw a transformation on how we viewed the voluntary sector. In the building phase, the voluntary sector was an ally of those who wanted to make change. It was a, a, a voice that we couldn't often hear. It was an expertise in how to deliver services in a granular way that we were too remote from. It was, in many respects, a champion for change. By the 80s, things have changed dramatically. And I would say there are three major changes. The first change was that um, increasingly voluntary sector in the departments I worked with was seen as overhead, an easy place to cut, as the demands to cut were increasing. This is an easy way to cut, especially those, those operations that weren't directly involved in service. So overhead. We also had, in, in that overhead, argument, we, we, there was a kind of growing marketization, a belief that the model of the future was the private sector, that government was supposed to become more and more like the private sector, a new public management. We were supposed to be much more like the private sector, but so too was the voluntary sector supposed to be more like the private sector. So withdrawing money was going to be a good thing because it would force the voluntary sector to compete for money in the real world and get better in this sort of private sector model. And of course, what we've learned is when you chase, when mission, mission chases money, mission often gets distorted and money starts to dominate. Now, it's, it was one of the, the, the beginning places of the change in how you, how voluntary sector built boards, boards that were much better able to attract money and to apportion staff 
where money collection became much more important than, I, than it had been in the past, and a certain timidity that one could actually observe creeping into board decision making, because in fact, you had to be more concerned about money. This, so overhead. The second, the second change, which, and again, I say this subjectively, that I witnessed when I was in the public service was instead of a partner, you, the, par the voluntary sector increasingly became a threat. And the threat wasn't because these were bad people wanting bad things. The threat was we understood in government in the 80s and 90s, part of our job was to reduce expectations, to lower expectations. If we were going to start dismantling, we were about the reducing expectations. And unfortunately, uh, the voluntary sector kept increasing expectations. So how do you deal with the threat? You deal with the threat by becoming less inviting to advocacy. You know, increasingly, instead of seeing the voluntary sector as a place where we get new ideas and new directions to build and new exciting partnerships, we started thinking, well, the voluntary sector would be a lot better if they came when they were invited. Oh, and the, when, when, when the department invites you, you sure come, but don't come uninvited and don't talk unless you're asked. You can, you can respond to a request for a parliamentary uh, review of a policy or, or a request for a department, but this advocacy thing, we've got to bring in, you know, it's 1985 that the, that the regulations in CRA, the, the tightening of our interpretation of what was permissible became formalized. It's not an accident. This was coincident with the concern that advocacy was going against the dismantling, constraining, reducing the, foot, the, the footprint of government. So the second thing was a kind of long-term chilling, constraining of advocacy and a disciplining of advocacy. So it looked much more like the policy that we're used to. You know, it's one of the reasons governments like think tanks because you can always find a think tank that shares your ideology and works in a currency that you're used to. But the, the ones that are speaking for the, for the voiceless, they're scary because they almost always mean that we have to change. All right, so a threat. And the third, the third was that the voluntary sector increasingly was seen in contradiction to the first two changes as a tool that we could use to manage our downsizing. So we saw, for example, the shift to contractual arrangements away from grants. That was not an accident. It started in the 80s and played and increased through the 90s. But the shift from grants to contribution agreements and to contractual arrangements was to say, you know, you, the voluntary sector can be a huge asset in delivering services at a lower cost. As an extension of government, not a complement of government, and over the last few years, as a substitute for government, and it's worse, as cover for government getting out of the delivery of essential services. So this was a, a, a tool that actually, I believe, reduced the independence of action of a lot of public, of a lot of voluntary sector organizations, just at the same time as we were reducing the independence of voice. So, the very, the very value added that I think is vital to democracy, vital to the policy process, the independence of voice and action, the ability to speak for those who have no voice, the ability to innovate and, the, the, and develop models of service that we could have never have imagined, has actually been undermined in my view. And so the question becomes, and, 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 and uh, the, the solution did not happen on October 19th. But the possibility of a solution should be energizing for this sector. Now, that one of the good things that happened in, in the period of the, of the big chill was that more and more voluntary sectors came to, uh, organizations came together and asked, how do we manage this collaboratively? What can we do together? Umbrella organizations became more important their mandates became stronger. Their, 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 
influence became stronger. This is an opportunity, not now to manage our survival, to manage our growth and our strength and the increased in independence and value added that will contribute not only to the government's policy agenda, but to the vibrancy of our democracy. And so that means we have to ask ourselves well, clearly, what is it we want, why does it matter? And what are the institutional mechanisms, a commission, uh, what are the, inst and I, I'm not gonna go into those though I have some biases, but what are the institutional legislative mechanisms that we want, that we decide in rooms like this, before we do the, the kind of voluntary sector initiative, which will actually sap all of the energy out of, out of this kind of, con until you know what you want, that engagement will not be productive. And, and the, understanding, building a consensus in a diverse group such as, as this is inevitably difficult, but surely we can agree that independence of voice, independence of action, and the ability to innovate are those core values that we bring to the table that pretty much nobody does. And as trust in government declines and as trust in the private sector declines, the potential for the voluntary sector to fill that role is both greater and more important than ever. I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, Alex. <laughs> so uh, I wanna try and, and pull a few <laughs> threads together here. Um, very interesting that both of you uh, see the opportunity uh, that is now open post-October 19th, uh, while both underlining and, uh, and highlighting that it is not in itself an it is not in itself a solution, uh, but that there is active work to be done uh, to be able to, to, to take advantage of the uh, of that. Uh, and I want to get to that in a in a moment. But first, um, Alex, I was quite uh, struck by your description of the evolution of the public sector over time um, and the retreat, if you will, of government away from. Uh, in many ways, frontline service delivery. Um, I would add to your description of the 90s that one of the first casualties uh, in our attempt to get back to balanced budget was the internal policy capacity uh, of governments. And so there is an opportunity there uh, for the voluntary sector, be that charitable foundations, think tanks, and other groups uh, to engage. That said, uh, you also alluded to some challenges you both did uh, that I think are really quite real and the same conversation could be had in a host of rooms, uh, whether it's a gathering of foundations, a gathering of think tanks, and it really is um, the possible tensions between the different roles that we might play in policy development. Um, do you, based on research, uh, produce and contribute content to policy discussion? Do you encourage civic engagement uh, and facilitate the entry of other voices into the dialogue? Um, do you create spaces for debate? Um, and we certainly see from the think tank side, and I, would, uh, I, I suspect um, people in this room uh, probably uh, live a similar situation, where there is a proliferation of actors in the policy space that say that they, they are engaging uh, based on research, based on advocacy. Um, it, there's a growing number of organizations that are saying, you know, we have a voice here. How, and, and maybe to you, Roger, first, and then, and then Alex, um, how does a charitable foundation navigate those waters? Where do you see that universe headed? Uh, and then we will, you know, based on that, then we can get into how do we take advantage of the new realities of Ottawa. But first, how do you see policy spaces evolve? How is that debate being held today, and where is that going? <coughs> it's quite a, <coughs> quite a question. <laughs> um, the, the policy space is becoming increasingly crowded. And we haven't quite figured out what to do with that. So we have charities, we have nonprofits. The distinction between the two is probably unknown to most, most Canadians. Hope that's not. Um, we have. <laughs> if it's for me. Uh... <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's, it's, it's become crowded. Uh, social media creates policy platforms that, that can be very powerful in mobilizing, mobilizing people. And a lot of the players in the policy, in this policy landscape, are not constrained 
They're not required by law to be balanced, to present both sides of an issue, not to be emotional, not to be political. They are political. They are emotional. They're, they're trying to mobilize political action, all the things that charities are not being encouraged to do. So I think the landscape is becoming more crowded. It's becoming more crowded internationally as well as charities and policy issues take on more and more of an international dimension. We just haven't come to grips with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the charities need, some, need to provide some guidance to an incoming government that is probably more sympathetic than the previous government. It's there to listen, but we have to provide the answers. We have to provide that, that policy voice. Alex, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you say more about that? <laughs> no, but, but I will. Uh, I, un I understand that, uh, that Matthew is going to take us tomorrow through uh, the policy process. And policy has so many different meanings that the diversity of the sector is designed to address all parts of it and not every organization, each part. So if you think about, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, Overton, the concept of Overton's window. They, oh, Joe Overton was a political scientist, and he, what he argued was at any given point in time, there are some things in the, in the policy window that are considered possible, normal, sensible. And outside of that window, it's crazy things. Like it, it would be crazy, for example, to have a national childcare system, but sensible to cut government and reduce taxes, right? So uh, open windows, there's always stuff that's in the window that uh, government sees as possible. One of the roles, in policy, roles of policy is to change what's in the window. That's not technical. That's not, that is a, filled with emotion. That is li giving people over the, the lived experience of those who've been excluded from the things there, making a case, arguing it, not in a partisan way and not in an unreasoned way, but in a way that, shaped, that helps to shape what's possible. So agenda setting is very different, for example, than issues identification, which is a more technical detail. And, and, and then, you know, I think of the Caledon Institute, I see playing a huge role in actual design of the National Child Benefit, and I'm sure uh, the, the next version of it. Um, if you go along this corridor, one of the things you have in this room is all of is this room and the rooms you work with, the larger sector, you have all of that skill set. And it's just important to start recognizing the different, you know, social change, and we're all kind of committed to social change. Social change needs poets. It needs engineers and plumbers. And it needs warriors. And the trouble is that these people don't tend to like each other. But you know, in your sector, you've got them all. And if you could ever get them to link up their different skill sets, you could play along the whole, uh, the whole array of what policy interventions mean. And it's doubly important for something Graham said. The capacity inside the public service has never been weaker. You know, one of the things about the public service is that there are muscles that haven't been exercised for a while. The policy muscle, the strategic policy muscle of building new things, it's not been exercised for a while. The federal provincial muscle of working collaboratively, is no, you know, we don't have first minister's meetings anymore. It's not been exercised. Those are places where you can assist the government. If a government that wants to achieve something is going to find out it needs you. And you know, I'm not worried about a Wild West show. I'm worried about an unwillingness to take this opportunity and maximizing it. So that's a good segue into uh, my next question, but I do want to uh, indicate that I believe it's Sarah, right? Uh, Sarah has a microphone, and so if you have a question for our panel or you'd like to comment uh, on something that you've heard, and there's another microphone as well uh, on this side of the room, and so by all means, uh, do uh, give us the show of hands and we'll make sure that we get a microphone to you. Um, but Alex, you're, the, you, the last point you were making is a good segue back to um, the parade that Roger wants us to build. Um, and I want to take you to that strategic planning process for building the parade. Mm -hmm. And we, perhaps we can leave aside you know, deciding who the clowns are going to be. Um, but how, so, so there is an opportunity uh, before us. And as you say, um, there are a number of things that, gov that, will be, uh, that the government will be seized with in the early, par in the early part of its mandate. Um, 
So what are the critical things the charitable foundation sector needs to do uh, in the next 18 months, two years, whatever the time horizon is, to be ready for the occasion when it comes? <clears throat> well, this brings us back to Preston Manning. <laughs> Does it really? But Pres <laughs> Preston Manning and Tom Flanagan talked about the surfer, right? And the surfer is sitting on the shore, boards all waxed, all the skills are there, but there are no waves. And so you just sit on the shore, nothing you can do. You have to be ready when the waves appear so you can then, then leap in. So I don't think we're ready in the sense that we don't know how to take the liberal campaign promise, which was actually pretty close to the very core of what charities have been looking for, some formal recognition of the role of charities in public policy. We don't know how to take that and crystallize it into some document, declaration, whatever, whatever it is. We've tried this in the past. It's evaporated. We have another shot at it. So I think that's what we have to do is to figure out what it is we want. Alex mentioned that. It's un unclear what we want. And we have to begin to articulate a way of applying enough political pressure on the government that they will roll that campaign promise into sort of the final years of their, of their first term. Not try to push it into the first term. There's simply no, no room initially, no room whatsoever. But that's our opportunity to do that, to do that kind of work. So it is strategic. And what are, some of the, what are some of the things that the sector needs to work out internally to be ready for that? Well, it has to, it has to be able to convince the, the government that if it moves on this file, it's not going to be attacked left, right, and center. It's, it's going to have some sort of workable consensus within the sector that they can then, that they can then defend. So we have to do, um, we have to do the, the hard work of trying to identify what are the sources of opposition, who can be brought on board, and how to bring the 99.4% of charities who are not engaged in this at all on, on, on side so that they will not descend on the government and say, what in the world are these people talking about? Right? This is not our world. Our world is the church. Our world is the social service. Our world is the athletic group. So we have to reach out beyond this sort of policy intense group and figure out how to communicate with that uh, broader sector. And one, other, one last point that's been bedeviling me a bit. Uh, notice in the election campaign the real emphasis on the middle class. Mm -hmm. If something doesn't help the middle class, it's sort of not on the agenda. Well, the charitable sector is not very well positioned in that. <coughs> Charities tend to help people who are not part of the middle class, and they tend to be funded by people who are not part of the middle class either. So how do we create a language that explains the role that charities can play in the broader society and therefore at least hook on indirectly to the middle class uh, rhetoric that's become so important? So Alex, what does the sector have to do to get ready for that interface with government when the opportunity comes? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but First of all, it's, it's going to happen organically. It's not going to happen in a linear way. In fact, it's happening now. I know there are people in this room already been invited to work with the government on various files, that there's an openness already. And so there's going to be all kinds of opportunity to learn together in, in an atmosphere that's probably more favorable. So, so I, I actually think we're going to the, the voluntary sector in a variety of ways, on the environment, on kids, on, on income support, is going to be in the room in a way it hasn't been in the room. And, and that's going to teach us again how to build that relationship. And it's going to remind government that where we're willing to play that role, we actually make a positive difference. So that's going to be the first stage. But I agree with Roger, the bigger picture items about the relationship between the voluntary sector and government is going to be a second half of mandate issue. And how do we get ready? I think we have to understand clearly what it is we want, and I, I would argue it's the independence of voice, independence of action. Why, a, a, a very clear case to be made about why that's important to, to government, and I believe that's linked to the quality of democracy and link it to some of the very strong commitments that this new government's made about democratic renewal. On the middle class thing, which drove me up a tree, I must say, all parties talking about the middle class is 
middle class desperately needs government to help them be middle class. I don't know. In any case. <laughs> Tell us how you feel, Alex. Come on. <laughs> I didn't love it. But, the, but on, on, the, on the positive side, you heard them say, and those aspire to it. And so there was an aspirational element. So I don't think, I don't think it was that, uh, that entirely definitive. But the key is democracy, the strength of democracy, the, the diversity of voices that are able to shape a kind of enriched form of democracy that happens between elections that the voluntary sector plays in shaping agendas and in, in designing policies that actually serve the intended and make sure all the voices are heard. I believe that that's a, a, an issue that's resonant, not just with this government, but with Canadians. I actually believe making the link between what we do and the quality of democracy is something we have failed to do. So fighting for our independence, making the case, and then looking, and we should have very strong ideas of what legislative and institutional changes we think are necessary yeah. to make that happen. And the more specific we are, the less we're likely to have the lifeblood sucked out of us by another voluntary sector initiative. And, and, and that means, I think, things like perhaps our own internal capacity to help each other and, 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 and to do collective things. Perhaps an institutional commission of charities, much like, like the UK has, but maybe a parliamentary one that's, that's immune from changes in government. And maybe the concrete development of spaces where the communication between the voluntary sector and government can, can occur. But in any case, I'm, you know, I'm not going to try to do a recipe. I have no expertise in this area. But the more we know what we're fighting for, the more we know why it matters to Canada and to this government, and the more we know what kind of mechanisms might actually help us get there, that's work we could do over the next few years to great, to great effect, I think, because that's what the opportunity is. Roger? Very small point. We, we spend a lot of time talking about what government can do for us. And, then, and in that way, we join a very long queue of people looking for what government can do for them. We have to make the argument that Alex suggested, that is, what can we do for government? How can we enrich the democracy within Canada? And I think we have a government now that's receptive to that, to that line of thought. So as we wait for the first brave soul <laughs> to signal that they want to intervene, um, hint. <laughs> um, let me pick up on that point, um, because you've, you've both uh, alluded to uh, doing the hard work to get prepared for the relationship, uh, but maybe, star maybe starting with you, Alex, what does that ideal relationship look like? I mean, you, you referred to the importance of keeping some independence, but at the same time, you have to be close enough to decision makers that you have access, that you can set that agenda and contribute to it. So what does that ideal relationship look, to, look like between the charitable foundation sector and the policy types within government? I, I mean, I do think the word partnership is entirely consistent with in, in independence. And independence doesn't deny interdependence. It means that each party brings their own strength to the relationship and there's, there's mutual respect. Right now, I would say the voluntary sector is seen as subservient to government, as, as subordinate to government. That's not partnership. What we, what we need is for, uh, for that relationship to be a relationship of equal parties, uh, bringing their unique strengths and their unique roles, and to institutionalize that. And that, that has a human dimension of getting to know each other and having constant regular ways of talking to each other, of learning each other's language, of affecting each other's relevancies, but also the institutional protections uh, that make sure that there is no co-optation. So, so it, it, it kind of looks, if, if, if I went over, as I was thinking about, about the kinds of things I, I was going to say, I, I went over, that's why I keep referencing it, the Voluntary Sector Initiative and some of the, what the roundtables came up with. And some of, the, some of the stuff really lays out what a partnership, some of the stuff that was killed, that never saw the light of day, that never made progress on defining charitable activity, on defining advocacy. It, it, it's a pretty good foundation. I mean, it's, it's not modern, it's not up to date, but it's a pretty good foundation. It's, that's why it didn't happen. It's a pretty good foundation for a much more respectful mutual partnership. Thank you. We do have one question in the middle of the room. Or a comment. Uh, <coughs> Peter Warren for the Lupina Foundation. Um, i just add to the comment, but a different way. F trying to think about the architecture of our efforts going forward. Uh, in my time in the PFC board, et cetera, and having the enormous 
uh, benefit of interacting directly with the Harper government. Uh, <coughs> I think there's a temptation, October 5th, October the 19th, you know, every policy walk in the, uh, you know, country, says our, the day of our liberation is at hand, <laughs> like Ike on the beaches of Normandy. <laughs> the, but it's not just Harper, and it's not just personality or ideology. That is, um, and it didn't just start with them. They have a different theory of the state. Naively in foundation land, as well as all the policy shops, we believe that we're in, governments are in the business of policy, policy making. There is a counter theory that actually arose in the previous liberal administration in response to the Romano com Commission, which is actually that's not true. Governments are in the business of making decisions. Now, you take that to its ideological thing, i.e., we have values, we got elected, now we're making decisions. We are not actually in the business of making policy. That's not our core business. We do that on the, as, at the <coughs> moment. That also characterized the McGuinty government in Ontario, so it's not just liberal. So as we think through how we move forward, we have to think that these, what we're dealing with and the theory of change we might operate on is these, these birds actually have a, th a different theory of the state that was fundamentally different, and it, it does go to where the fault line is in between the business of government as making decisions, particularly allocative decisions, but also uh, making policy, which is a different fear, uh, sphere, and we have to think that through. Or I invite your comments on that. <coughs> Roger? <coughs> yeah. I, like, I like your comments. I like your comments a lot. Um, I'm not sure I would draw such a, a firm line between making decisions and making sort of allocative policy. Um, that's, they're, they're part and parcel of the, of, the, of the same thing. The caution I extract from your, your comments is that the sector has to be careful that we don't become advocates for a certain model of, of government that's big and, big and expansive, that we are, we are neutral in terms of creating a role, for, a role for charities, a role in terms of trying to inform the decisions governments make without necessarily advocating a certain general direction to government. Let me, let me just go back to the, the, the Liberal campaign platform and imagine an act of parliament that has almost the identical words. You know, parliament hereby affirms and supports the important role that charities can and should play in developing and advocating for public policy in Canada. To my mind, that could be quite a breakthrough step because it would send a message to the charitable sector that advocacy makes sense. It's something that charities should be doing. It would send a message to the courts, which have not served anyone particularly well since 1601 or whatever it is the courts keep going back to. It would serve a message that the policy landscape has changed in some, in some way. And it would send a message to funders and to boards that policy advocacy is part of the game the charities, the charities are in. So I think that that can be done without necessarily endorsing a particular model of, model of government because then we, have the, we run the risk that we'll be caught on sort of the, the ideological swings of government and we'll end up on the wrong side again. And that, that I think would be unfortunate. Quick comment from Alex, and if you'd like, and then we have another question. Yeah, I, I was an interesting comment. Uh, my sense is, th yes, there's a different model of government. It preceded, it preceded the Harper government, and it isn't unique to the federal government. And it has a lot to do with whether governments see themselves as managing decline and, and the reduction of their, their footprint. And I would argue that, that this previous government had a narrower vision of government, what it does, than previous governments. Its focus was on the protection of life, liberty, and property, a kind of pre-war sense that its job was to prevent bad things and less to do good things. And, and that, that meant much more about decisions and a lot less policy, except in the criminal justice. And even there, m much more focus on, on punishment and, and building that apparatus than on policy. So I, th I saw a shift away from policy. That muscle has not been used. And I agree with what a lot of what some of what one, one thing that Roger, uh, nothing at all that Roger said. Uh, yes, we should not be caught up in this 
notion that we're here to build big government, nor should we be part of this notion that we're here to help small government. This, this notion that size of government's the issue is, is a huge distraction. I mean, it, 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 the real question for us is what's government for and who is government for? And we have a huge role in helping to find that. Because I th in, in fact, if, if government is for the most wealthy or the middle class, that's, that's, but that's not what we want. We want government to be for the many, including the many that we represent. So we have a huge role. And that might mean bigger government. That's not the issue. The issue is what's government for, who's government for, and let size be the outcome, not the, not the driver. You know, making government smaller or making government bigger is not the issue. Making government work for the many is the issue. And you have a huge role to play, given the diverse voices that you interact with and represent. Thank you. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Lee Rose. I'm with Community Foundations of Canada and the Community Knowledge Exchange. Um, I woke up on the 20th kind of excited. Um, <laughs> it was like, for me, it was like that first day of spring when your parents let you take your bike out again after a cold winter, you know, like that kind of excitement about, yes, it's happened, and I can sort of be excited about what, what's going on about that. But that, there's still ice on the road, right, when you take out your bike the first time in the spring. So I feel like we're kind of in this, like, really excited period. It's new and it's exciting. But I guess my question is, you know, <laughs> we keep talking about this chill with, under the Harper government, and we kind of blame the boogeyman, that it's easy to blame, the, externalize that failure or whatever on, on Harper not getting it. Um, and that kind of thing. So I, I wonder, like, how much of that advocacy chill was a chill of our own making, and it's sort of a self-fulfilling kind of thing, where we said, oh, there's a chill, so, oh, there's a chill, and then the chill exists because we say it exists. Um, and how do we, in this sort of spring of, um, you know, sunny ways, um, make sure that we don't become complacent and just assume that things will get better because there's a liberal government? And um, we've had liberal governments before, um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I want to take the bike out, and I want to be all excited about what's coming forward, but how do we make sure that we're not going to be complacent and just assume that it will always be sunny ways? Very good question. Who wants to <coughs> tackle that one first? Well, there's a certain irony, in, to my mind, in the, in, in the election. Um, charities, by their legal character, have to be nonpartisan. That's, that's sort of the, the, gold, the golden rule. The charitable sector, over time, the last four years, eight years, 12 years, became partisan in the sense that they positioned themselves against the government, the government of the day. So the risk is that, that the spring will enhance a partisan identification between the government of the day and the sector, which I think will be harmful because it will, it will blunt the critical capacity that the sector has and that the government needs as it addresses this very, very complex, complex agenda. So there is a risk, I think, that we will bask in the sun. We'll fall asleep. You know, we'll be happy, we'll be, everything will look, will look good, except that the policy debates will shift elsewhere. They will still be, uh, they'll still take place, but they'll take place through Bob and Nanaimo. They'll take place outside the country. They'll take place in a whole variety of groups who are not constrained in any way by art, by the limitations imposed on, on charities. So, you know, yeah, enjoy the day, but if it's, it becomes a season, if it becomes a year, if it becomes an epoch, we're, we're in trouble. Alex? Yeah, I don't think anybody here thinks the chill started or, uh, with Harper and ended with October 19th. I don't, and in fact, it started in the 80s, and we talked a little bit about that. And I do think, you know, I, I honestly am not partisan. I, I know who I hate, and, but, I, <laughs> but, but, but I, but that's I'm, the I, after dinner program. But, <laughs> but I, I'm not partisan. But I felt like you did. I, I just uh, don't have a bike. But the. <laughs> but the issue of complacency isn't about the voluntary sector. It's about the country. You know, and I don't know how we can think about being complacent. If you just, before dinner, in case any of you are feeling cheerful, which is totally inappropriate, <laughs> think about it. Stagnant economy for as long as the eye can see. This government 
is going to have to manage some version of austerity, just like the liberal governments did after they inherited the Harris uh, treasuries. There's more austerity and cuts coming. That, that's not by choice. That's what they've inherited, and the reluctance to, to, to increase taxes means there's cuts coming. So you've got, you've got a stagnant economy. You have huge publicly held debt. It's really unnerving. You have growing inequality and deep pockets of poverty and exclusion and a huge aboriginal injustices. You have environmental deterioration and climate change coming at us awful quickly because it's here and that's quick. And you have intergenerational inequities that are truly profound and possibilities of lost generations and eroding democracy. So if you are worried about complacency, so am I. This is not the moment for complacency. We have, you know, in my worst moments when I'm allowing myself to be unfiltered and, and with aging I have lost many of my filters. It's, it's, it, was, it was the second thing, did my hair, then my filters, and I'm not telling you what's next. And <laughs> what I like to say is a decade of darkness has ended. A decade of opportunity has presented itself, but if we don't seize the opportunity, it's the second decade of darkness. There you go. And I will take the opportunity to take the next question. It's on? Yes. Hi, uh, Hillary Pearson. Hi. Uh, I'm going to take my license of uh, being the organizer to also ask the last question because I'm afraid we will have to break for our reception and dinner soon. Uh, and I'm really sorry because I think this is a fantastic conversation. And I really hope a lot of people are going to want to continue it and are going to uh, have an opportunity perhaps at the reception to talk to all three of you and to ask the questions that otherwise we don't get a chance to ask. So I'm going to take also my license of, of being the organizer to ask the last question. Um, I want to pick up on what Peter said about the theory of the state. Uh, and I agree with Peter. I mean, I think there are different theories of the state. And I think it's important to, to be aware and mindful of those. And I think similarly, and, and Tim Broadhead, if he were in the room, I, I would immediately say I'm quoting Tim, but I'll channel Tim now. Tim would say what we're missing is also a theory of philanthropy. We need a theory of the state. We need a theory of philanthropy. We don't have one. Arguably in this sector, we do not have a theory of philanthropy. We have a lot of ad hoc views about the ways in which foundations should operate, could operate, do operate. But that doesn't add up to a coherent theory of philanthropy. And part of the problem, I think, that the voluntary sector as a whole has had, and that philanthropy certainly has, is that because we don't have a narrative about ourselves, there's a vacuum, and that vacuum is filled by others. So to the extent that the voluntary sector has no narrative, although there have, I know, been attempts to create that narrative about us, but to the extent that there is no narrative that's coherent and that we can articulate well, uh, the vacuum is filled by others. Let's take the overhead myth as a, a something that has been much more important uh, than it should be because there hasn't been a good narrative to counter it. Uh, and funders have bought into, the, to, into this as well as charities. It's best not to fund overhead. It's best to fund only charities that tell you that they're going to devote 100% of their money to programs and somehow magically do that running on empty, running on no budget for their overhead. So I think you know we all know about that overhead myth and the fact that there is no <coughs> counter narrative to it. So if we had a theory of philanthropy, and I'd like to ask you both, if you could, to comment on that. If we had a theory of philanthropy, would that help us uh, create that more effective role in the, the parade that you're talking about, Roger? You know, we, we, we as, and I'm really bringing this back to the foundation sector, not to the broader charitable sector, but to the foundation sector. If we could endow ourselves with that theory of philanthropy, what do you think that would be? And do you think that's necessary? And then we'll turn it back to, uh, to Graham for closing. I was going to volunteer to be one of the clowns, not the, not the float in the, in the parade. I, I would, I guess, frame your question a little bit differently, Hillary. I think Canadians are preoccupied with a theory of the state. 
And where we've been deficit is in about a theory of democracy and sort of a, a broader understanding of what makes a democratic society work. So as long as we try to figure out how charities work with the state, we're, we're in a, a ground that is not very exciting, it's not very uh, creative, it doesn't engage Canadians. So what we need, I, I think, is a broader definition of what a democratic society looks like in Canada because then the voluntary sector, then charities come into play in a rather large, in a rather large way. But if we, if we are state focused and we're talking about the traditional Canadian, you know, federal provincial relations and all of this kind of stuff, it doesn't really ignite the kind of conversation you want to have. So I would, I would edge into a theory of, of philanthropy by looking more extensively at what democracy means in a contemporary society. I don't think we've done that, and I think it's time we could do that. And a lot of that innovation will come, you know, out of groups like Graham's and out of the uh, charitable community. Thank you, Alex. I I agree with that. I mean, I th I think I I also accept uh, Hillary your question. I think a narrative is really key, explaining the diversity of roles that you play, what purpose you serve. But I think grounding that in the role of civil society in a healthy democracy. That's the starting point. That understanding philanthropy and the voluntary sector as a component, a key component of civil society, and understanding that going forward we need, uh, or from my bias, we need strong government to harness the forces of the market for the public good, and we need strong civil society to harness the forces of government for the public good. So that being the final question, um, in terms of closing, uh, let me say that if the question of this session was, does philanthropy have a role in the public landscape, I think you have both uh, answered it with a resounding yes. Uh, I'm quite taken, though, by the emphasis you both put um, on the notion that much of the work has to start in this room. It's not about engaging others yet, that there are lots of things that we need to sort out, perhaps well, in terms of articulating a theory of philanthropy uh, that can guide future action and individual contributions. Uh, but certainly, I think that's uh, an important takeaway. And, and, and to, to, to flip the notion away from what can government, this new one or others in the future or past, can do for us, but what have we as a sector to offer to government? Uh, and I suspect that will be uh, a frame that will come again and again uh, as we move to tomorrow's program and other, uh, and other sessions like this in the weeks and months to come. Uh, but for uh, launching this conversation uh, with such uh, uh, insight and thoughtfulness, uh, please join me in thanking our panel.